Where are we now? The next question is, here we are. It's from Catherine Kersey, and it goes as follows. Dr. Starkey, and we're still on the subject of Mary here, by the way, um, uh, and indeed, Philip, um, why did King Henry not arrange an advantageous marriage for Mary instead of marrying so many times to try to get a son? Do you think he was afraid she would marry a Spanish noble who would then become King of England? Well, of course, she did marry a Spanish noble, or rather a Spanish prince, who did become King of England, uh, namely Philip. But the arrangement, as I've just described um, uh, in, in the, 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 the previous answer, about Philip's status in England, the marriage treaty made absolutely sure that although Philip did become king when he marries Mary, Philip wears the crown matrimonial. There is no nonsense um, about being a prince consort in those days. And not only does he wear the crown matrimonial, he takes precedence of Mary. The reign now is renamed. It becomes not the reign of Mary the first, but the reign of Philip and Mary. And Privy Council reports primarily to Philip. Philip is really king and Mary is Mary has a much more conventional view of the role of, of women than Elizabeth and she defers as a good wife, as a queen, to Philip's king, as a woman to Philip's man and as a queen to Philip's king. Um, so in one sense <laughs> that last sentence does come true. But let's go back to the beginning. Why doesn't Henry, Catherine asks, not arrange an advantageous marriage for Mary instead of marrying so many times to try to get a son? Well the answer is Henry did exactly that. Mary, remember, is born in 1516 and Henry doesn't contemplate marriage with Anne until the 1st of January 1527. That is a long time. It's 11 years in which Henry is content, well, seems to be, only to have a female heir. And in that time, absolutely, Catherine, one of the great issues of English policy is whom shall Mary marry? Indeed, Scarisbrick in his biography argues that it is the prime determinant of English foreign policy in this period, which is to marry Mary to a foreign prince who is sufficiently strong to be able to impose her as a woman on the throne of England. Because remember, although we take female succession so much for granted, that is Henry's own doing. That's the doing of the enormous hold that Henry VIII comes to have on the English people and their imagination and the effect of his will, which legitimates and normalises female succession. Before that, no woman had ever sat on the throne of England. If it was thought that a woman could sit on the throne of England, then why on earth doesn't Lady Margaret Beaufort become Queen Margaret I never in fact to be succeeded by Henry the Seventh because she outlives him by a few weeks and clearly the thought was that only a man could become king because the only time that there had actually been uh, the, 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 when there was a serious attempt at imposing female succession was with Henry the First uh, when uh, after the the death of of, of his son um, uh, in uh, William the Eighth thing uh, after after the death of his son uh, in the White Ship um, he tries to impose his daughters daughter Matilda as queen. Uh, whilst he's alive, the English swear to it. The moment he is dead, uh, although she makes a very serious attempt at taking London and whatever, although she is briefly recorded as Lady of the English, that's the title in those days that you're given before you're crowned. In other words, uh, 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 the, the, the claimant of the throne, uh, who is not yet crowned, is called Lord of the English, and therefore she is called Lady of the English, because then, although it's pretty quickly abandoned. Only coronation makes you a fully legitimate monarch. Um, uh, but um, uh, uh, um, Matilda 
remember, is arrogant and ruthless. The Londoners very quickly decide they dislike her and there's absolutely no question of them permitting the coronation to go ahead. And in any case, Stephen comes along and you embark on that terrible decades long uh, civil war, uh, which rips the country apart until Matilda's son, Henry II, actually managed to make his claim good and founds the Plantagenet din dynasty and one of the great peaks of medieval England. So Mary then, the feeling was, Henry's feeling was, Henry seems to be perfectly happy, makes absolutely clear he's perfectly happy with Mary, um, but she requires a very powerful spouse to make sure that she will actually hold the throne. Let's just quickly look at, uh, at, at what all of that implies. Henry, I think, has a very serious relationship with Catherine of Aragon. Henry loves all his wives when he marries them. How quickly he falls out of love with them uh, and for what reasons is an entirely separate question. Um, Henry also clearly passionately loves Mary. Mary is very much his image. She has the same colour, uh, she has the same flaming auburn hair, the same pale skin, the same powerful character, that's why they clash uh, so terribly. As a child and, and a young woman, uh, as a teenager, uh, she, she is good looking and attractive and Henry lavishes astonishing efforts on her education. She receives the education, exactly the same sort of education that Elizabeth will receive and the same sort of education that his beloved son and heir, the future uh, Prince Edward, will receive highly sophisticated in, in, in Latin, French, Greek, all the rest of it. Um, uh, and again, the skills, the arts of music, of dancing and so on. Um, so, he is clearly educating her as heiress. Moreover, she is actually, for a short period of time, and is the only woman to be so, formally declared Princess of Wales. She is even sent off as Henry's elder brother had been, and as, as Arthur had been. She's even sent off to Ludlow to head the Council of the Marches of Wales. And all the time that's going on, of course, there are important marriages arranged for her. The most important of them is to the Emperor Charles V, and there's a, which of course Catherine is delighted about. Uh, the Emperor Charles V uh, is Catherine's nephew. Um, there is that sense, she has that sense of the reuniting of the, of the, uh, of the English and Spanish and Imperial royal houses, which, of which her own marriage, of course, had actually been the great testament. And Mary, clearly, is passionately committed to this idea herself. And once again, it's shown by a portrait. There is a lovely portrait miniature of Mary, it's very powerful, firm, square-jawed girl, um, wearing a huge brooch, which says Emperor, Emperor, in diamonds going across here, uh, presumably made for presentation to Charles V to remind him of the commitment. But the problem is, poor Mary, she's the wrong age. She's too young for Charles V, who desperately needs an heir and goes off and marries somebody else, and she's too old for the obvious alternative, which is the children of Francis I. So poor woman falls between stools. And then, of course, there's the terrible, the shattering humiliation of her parents' divorce. And this, Catherine, is where Mary's status changes completely and why she ceases to be a serious dynastic pawn, a serious dynastic chess piece for Henry. Because, of course, when Henry divorces Catherine, he doesn't divorce her. That, that is the phrase we use. The, the marriage is annulled, and it's annulled from the very beginning, which means, of course, terribly, Mary by this point um, is, is a teenager, it means terribly from Mary's position, she is declared a bastard, bastardized, and still worse from her position. She, her bastardy is enforced on her, uh, by being required to serve in the household of Elizabeth, daughter of Anne Boleyn. So 
at that point, of course, Henry, Mary, Mary's of no use. She's just a royal bastard. Nobody wants to marry her. Um, she, she's, she's, she's not an important player. Um, and what we forget, of course, is although Anne Boleyn is repudiated and poor Elizabeth is bastardised in turn, that did not mean Mary was legitimated. The, the, there seems to have been a double movement against Anne Boleyn. There's, there's, there's the movement associated with Cromwell on the one hand. There was also a very important group of, of, of people who are much more conservative uh, in religion. We sometimes call them the Aragonese faction at court. Uh, people uh, like the Marquis of Exeter uh, and so on, uh, and Nicholas Carew and whatever. They were all confident that Henry would actually legitimate Mary um, after um, he he'd got rid of Anne. They didn't understand Henry. Henry is determined. It's very, very extraordinary. Henry only thought that he had actually married two wives. Mm -hmm. Henry's the only wives that Henry actually recognises is Jane Seymour. Of course, that great strategic calculation gives birth to a son and then dies immediately afterwards, so nothing can go wrong there. And finally, to his last wife, to Catherine Parr. None of the other marriages are recognised as being legitimate and therefore uh, uh, valid. Um, they are null and void and therefore their children are bastardised. Now, but you're going to say, I'm sure you know, Henry when he revises the various acts of succession, recognising, although that he has an heir, Edward, life is fragile, the life of a boy, one boy is fragile, so what does he do? He puts his daughters back into the succession, and he gives Mary precedence, so Mary's back in the succession, as, and then is Elizabeth third. But, although he puts them into the succession, he does not legitimate them. Talk about having your cake and not eating it. Quite, quite extraordinary. Um, uh, so they, they, they are not, under, whilst Henry is around at any rate, they're not marriageable propositions. The moment Mary becomes queen, of course, uh, she has her bastardy reversed and there are the marriage negotiations from Philip and all the rest of it, which we needn't go into here. Um, and ag again, you know, you get the sense from those first acts of Mary's reign of her passionate burning resentment at the divorce of her parents, at her bastardy, and at the fiery blame that she directs at Thomas Cranmer, uh, the, 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 the acts um, legitimating her and reversing the divorce of her parents. The, the, the whole legal language breaks down when it talks of Cranmer and there's that sense of burning hatred and determination for revenge which of course she has when he's burned alive. So that's the story of uh, why, although to begin with, Mary's marriage is indeed very much an alternative to, uh, uh, to, to, to a quest for another wife and, and, and the succession of a son. The moment Anne Boleyn comes along, the moment Henry falls desperately and determinedly in love with Anne, the moment they agree over that extraordinary Christmas and New Year of 1526-1527 to marry, and Henry writes the letter, the letter now in the Vatican with the rest of the Henry VIII letters, um, uh, Henry VIII love letters to Anne Boleyn, the moment Henry declares in that letter to Anne, out illic, out nullibi, either there, marriage to you, or nowhere. Poor Mary is lost. Hello, and thank you for watching David Starkey Talks. If, as I very much hope, you're enjoying them, why not become more actively involved and join my Members Club? As a member, you'll be able to take part in the members-only weekly question and answer session suggest topics for forthcoming videos and have priority booking for my forthcoming live events. And while you're at it, why not have a look at the store page on my website davidstarkey.com. There you can purchase t-shirts and other merchandise, buy signed copies of my books and, if you're feeling brave and a bit flush, even arrange to take me out to lunch. 
Thank you once again for watching. I look forward to hearing from you and to welcoming you to my Members Club.